To kick off, I wanted to start you off by uh, talking about something about your upbringing uh, and how normal an upbringing it was. Um, and were there any moments during your upbringing that you felt uh, were, the, were the points that you could pinpoint uh, where your business success, uh, the seeds were sown for your business success? So I arrived in the UK with my parents in 1962. So I've been here for a couple of years now. And my father arrived here effectively because uh, he was in Pakistan, and Pakistan had just gone through partition with India. So the country was in a bit of a mess. And I think like a lot of people, he was looking to provide a better life for his children and arrived in the UK. And one of the things that really stands out in my mind when I reflect back, and I, and I wrote my autobiography that I, I kind of dedicated to my father was when I was writing the book, I kind of envisage this chap arriving in 1960 um, who'd never been to school, couldn't read and write, couldn't speak English, and arrived in England to, to make a better life for his kids. When I look at some of the privileged opportunities that we get, I try and visualize what would it be like to arrive in a country where you didn't speak the language, you couldn't read and write, and even how do you get from Victoria you know, into the city. I mean, how do you do that? How do you start a business when you can't sign your name? And so when I look at the sacrifices that our parents made to give us a better life, I mean, for me, that was probably the most inspirational journey. The, the conviction and determination that I think he put in to provide something better for us, I think, was my basic DNA that allowed me the, the kind of confidence and belief because when you start from that position, everything else looks really easy because actually when I look at what he did and the opportunities that he created for us, because if he had not have made that sacrifice, if he hadn't have made that commitment, you know, I wouldn't be sitting on that silly TV show mm -hmm. saying I'm out. So you know, that for me, I would say, was the kind of making mm -hmm. of, of really what inspired me to believe that, that you know, I could run a business. You know, we all know. Um, making choices have a serious impact, uh, have a serious impact on the rest of your life and where you go and which branch you take and, and, and which route you take even. Um, it would be interesting for the audience to know and for you to share any key choices that you made quite early on. And I was thinking, for example, um, using the name James. Uh, that was a choice you made. It's What's wrong with James? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's from the gospel, of course. Uh, um, but, you know, making these key choices and the impact it's had, you know, it's a legacy. It goes on from there. But you seem to have made a number of key choices which have been very successful later on in life. So, and, and it's interesting you mentioned about the choice your dad made. A lot of our parents, uh, those of us who come from uh, immigrant backgrounds, our parents made those choices of leaving very comfortable lives wherever they were, and in some cases not very comfortable lives, of course, and coming to the UK to make a better life. Can you share some choices that you made that you thought were absolutely key? I'd love to say that the, the, the concept of, of adopting the name James Khan was a key choice that was strategic and well planned, and it's the one that you know I probably had half a million emails in the last five years of people <laughs> saying that, you know, did you change your name to be successful in business? And sometimes it makes me laugh because I think if only life was that easy, that you just had to change your name and you became a millionaire, then I think we'd all do it. So clearly that was not the reason. The truth of the matter is um, I was 16. I went to see a movie. It was called Godfather. I thought Sonny was a really cool character. He was called James Khan, huh. and I was just fascinated by the way he spelt Khan as in C-A-A-N and not K-H-A-N. And having been brought up in this country, I didn't recognize the concept of K-H and thought Khan actually sounds like it should be spelt C-A-A-N. And just for humor's sake, I thought I changed to C-A-A-N. I was at the movies with a bunch of friends of mine who said, if you're gonna change C-A-A-N, why don't you call yourself James Khan? And it was a joke. It was simply a joke. <laughs> And so I said, that'd sound like a cool idea. So it was one of those things you do as a kid because you think it's funny, but did I ever believe that 35 years later I'd be still carrying the name? I didn't. 
because it's just one of those things that when you grow up as a kid, sometimes your parents give you a nickname and it just stays with you for no particular reason. And I think at the time, I just said to my friends, for the next week, I'm going to be James Caan. Mm -hmm. And it was just simple fun. And I was at a railway station and it was one of those things where you put in 50p and you've got your business cards printed. And I put 50p in there and I had these cards printed, James Caan. And it was just a bit of fun. I'd meet somebody, I'd give them my card, it'd be a bit of fun. Next thing, I started a job and it said, you know, name, and I put sort of James Khan in brackets. I put Nazim Khan. So I wasn't ashamed of it, but it just seemed like a bit of fun. Before you know it, you kind of adopt the name, becomes a bit cool. I start a job and I'm known as James Khan. I meet my wife, I'm known as James Khan. And it was only, and then of course I have my kids and, and they know me as James Khan. And the thing that really, dawned on me was one day we were on holiday and we arrive at the um, hotel and at that time my business cards and credit cards were all James Khan but of course my passport was Nazim Khan so I give my passport and she's fine and they take a photocopy and then you have to give your credit card um, you know for your incidentals and she's like which one are you? Mm -hmm. um, so I said, actually, I'm, I'm the same, but it doesn't really matter because the credit card's okay. And, and she made such a big fuss because, of course, I fully understand two different names. And I said to my wife, you know, I think I'm at that stage in life. I need to make a decision that, you know, at some point I'm going to have to choose which one I'm going to be. By then, of course, it was really too late because my kids, my work, my business, etc. So I officially adopted the name James Khan. Um, and to be honest, I have no regrets. I think, you know, there's a lot of people who grow up and realise that actually, that if they had been born and had the choice of picking their own name, they may have picked a different name. So I'd love to say it was strategic, it was well planned, but it was a joke. James, thanks for sharing that. I, I explained to the audience before you came or narrated to the audience a little bit about your business career and um, the exits from Alexander Mann and Humana uh, around 2003 and then you took a sabbatical around 2004. I think one of the things I neglected to say in the, um, in the um, update on um, the CV was that James, during his sabbatical period, actually went to Harvard Business School and did a course at Harvard Business School and then he came back from there and that's when Alexander Mann was founded and um, he invested um, in various companies from there on. So, I'm trying to put myself into your shoes, and I'm sure others do the same, and think, OK, uh, I'm in 2004. I come home one day. Uh, my wife, Aisha, is there. She's prepared this phenomenal uh, curry and naan uh, dish for you. Um, and, and you're sitting there. We actually there. have a cook, Shabir. She doesn't cook. <laughs> but in those days, I remember she used to do some of it. OK. Uh, but Aisha actually was in the business with him, as it happens. Um, but anyway, this, this meal is there on the table. Uh, you've come home, probably been out playing tennis, because by then you'd sold the business, or you're troubling some of your friends, or whatever. Um, you come home, and then you've got all this money in the bank, suddenly. Um, and you and, decide to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, partly that, and, and why not just buy a beach house, and you know, or buy an island for that matter, or whatever it is, and go and you know, hang up your boots and, and, and take it easy. Uh, what went through your mind at that stage it gave you this um, urge to go back to school, and then whatever followed from that? I think one of the things that I realized was when I had sold the business that I think everybody assumes that if you had created a business that you've successfully sold, that you must have this clear plan in your mind as to what you're going to do. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to tell you that was the case, but it wasn't. I didn't actually have a clue. I think what happens is you, you build a business and you go through life with this ultimate aim of realizing value, realizing capital, you know, and it's a dream and it, it's this big goal that one day, because I think what happens is, as most entrepreneurs, we are asset rich but cash poor. So you rarely actually have cash. You may own shares and you own your company, but you think that one day you may actually be able to convert those assets into cash. Um, will it happen? Who knows? So I didn't really kind of have a plan other than you know, would it happen? And when the opportunity rose, I could sell the company and realize the cash. I was so engrossed with the journey of the transaction and the sale and everything else 
that actually I didn't really have time to think about what would happen. I think the kind of bigger decision that, that really is what made me sell the business because as an Asian, it's in our DNA and our culture that we don't sell businesses. We build them for thousands of years. We hand them over to kids and grandkids, you know, but we don't part with equity. It's not what we do. Mm -hmm. So that was probably a bigger question because that I think is, is quite unusual for somebody like me to do that. And when I did get an offer for the company and I spoke to my father, you know, he looked at me in disgust and horror. It was like, you know, I was blaspheming to say, I'm gonna sell the company. Because in his head, he couldn't understand why does anybody build an amazing business that's successful, that's well known, you know, massive reputation, very profitable, why would you sell it? And at the age of 42, what in God's name would you do anyway? So as far as he was concerned, it made no sense. Friends and family and people I spoke to all said exactly the same. So if I'd spoken to kind of 20 people, 20 of them said, you're mad. And of course, being the maverick that I am, you know exactly what I did. I took everybody's <coughs> advice and did the opposite. And the fundamental reason why I sold the business was I kind of reflected and said, you know, most people typically would do this at 65 or 70. But the problem at that point is, what are you gonna do with the money? You've kind of spent most of your life working. And at that time, the truth of the matter is, it probably isn't much fun. So I thought, imagine how cool it would be at 42, at the peak of your career, to be in a position to have that kind of capital and play. Because of course, I'd left school at 16, I'd been working all the way through, and I never really had the chance to enjoy the success that I'd created. So the idea of, of doing something completely ridiculous at the height of your career, of selling the business and not actually knowing what you were gonna do, that for me, just the fear, the excitement of not knowing was just too, just too tempting to just kind of dive in and sell it. It took me all of eight days to get bored, you know, having the money and nothing to do. And I genuinely sat in the kitchen one morning and thought, you know, maybe I'll become a non-executive and I'll get a job and come in and advise other firms. And for the first time in my life, I actually wrote a CV. Um, I, you know, placed millions of people in jobs, but I never actually wrote a CV. So I sat there, wrote my CV, and I got to the third line that said education. And I took a, a slight breath because I thought, you know, I've spent all of my life apologizing for not having an education. I now have two daughters that are growing up and I'm lecturing them on the importance of having a, a university degree and how they have to go to university. They look at me and they say, but dad, you did sort of okay without a degree. Why is it so important? And I thought maybe, you know, it's the one thing that I feel that I didn't have. I felt I didn't get the opportunity and decided at that point I should go to university and kind of fulfill an ambition that I'd had, but also to be a good father and be a role model for the kids because I think it's quite important if you're trying to encourage your children to do something that maybe you didn't believe in or you didn't do, it, it doesn't sound right. So I think at that time I thought, you know, what could I do? And, and Harvard was something that you kind of dreamed about, you admire, and et cetera. And so I thought maybe I'd go to Harvard Business School, I'd do a business degree because maybe, you know, I might have been more successful had I had a decent education. And that was, I think, quite an important choice because that actually did change my whole outlook of what I was going to do. And as a consequence of going to Harvard, it inspired and motivated me to launch a private equity firm because essentially I'm a recruitment consultant. You know, I'm effectively, I'm not a, a private equity guy. I still, to this day, don't know how to use Excel. I'm not good at spreadsheets. Um, you know, I can add up, you know, I can use a calculator, but that is the extent of my financial expertise. And Harvard kind of really gave me the confidence of understanding financial engineering, dynamics, and balance sheets, because up until then, I had just always recognized that to be successful, anything that you were weak in, you surrounded yourself with people who made you look good in that particular area. So I happened to hire some of the smartest financial people you could find, because that was my Achilles heel. That was what I was embarrassed about. So I always made sure the things that I didn't particularly do well, I would make sure I'd hired people who could do those things better than I could. I think one of the key traits, I think, of being successful in business is knowing the things that you can't do or you're not good at. Rather than being embarrassed about them, embrace them, accept them, 
but then address them <coughs> by having people who can do those for you. And I think that, for me, was, was one of the biggest lessons that I learned, that actually you don't have to be a hero. You don't actually have to be good at everything. You just have to understand and know what you can't do and make sure that you have people who do those better. So those, for me, I think were quite <coughs> key lessons along the journey. Having business success and business limelight, you know, lots of people have had that. It's a huge jump from there to the public eye and um, being on media and TV. <coughs> what made you take Dragon's Den on and, and how did that transform you or, or what effect did that have on you from both a business and a personal point of view? Can you share some of that? I mean, Dragon's Den was probably one of the most exciting things that I've ever done because, again, I'd love to say to you, it was planned, it was organized, uh, but it wasn't. It really just happened out of the blue. Um, I got a call from the BBC and they were effectively looking for somebody who invested in people because each of the dragons have a specialism. So, you know, Theo's a retail guy, Peter's technology, Deborah's the environment, um, Duncan is kind of leisure. <coughs> and I built a bit of a reputation of backing people. Um, and really, in my 30-year business career, I don't feel that I have the necessary skills to understand every business, but what I do understand is people. So my mantra has always been that I don't invest in businesses, I invest in people. And Dragon's Den kind of quite liked that twist. So they approached me and said, you know, would you be interested in doing the show? And I had literally just set up a private equity firm, and one of the biggest challenges of a private equity firm that's been going for 10 minutes that nobody's heard of is how do you go and find new opportunities? Why would anybody bring me an opportunity? Nobody's ever heard of me, nobody knows me. And, and I, how do you market private equity? So when they called and said, look, you know, would you like to do a TV show that six million people watch and we'll market you, we'll promote you, we'll bring you opportunities, we'll bring you people, it costs you nothing. It kind of sounded like quite a good idea, actually. I thought, <laughs> why wouldn't you do that? And I had absolutely no idea of what the impact of television is, because how would you know if you've never done it before? So it never even dawned on me. I never thought for either two seconds as to what would the impact of TV be, because I had nothing to compare it with. Well, of course, you do the TV show, and oh my God, within the first episode, you know, it went ballistic. I mean, literally, I was getting 400,000 emails a month on my website because just the sheer volume of people who watch that show that have got good ideas and business ideas, etc. And it also just transformed the private equity firm because now you can imagine one day we're having to walk the streets, cold calling, accountants, lawyers, bankers, trying to find an opportunity to literally the next day you have a barrage of people literally bringing you hotel deals, investment deals, private equity deals. So I think for both the, the kind of PR publicity mm -hmm. just created a machine where, you know, since then, I think I've now got a portfolio of 42 companies that I've invested in outside of Dragon's Den, but which I can absolutely say to you are a res as a result of the kind of branding and marketing mm -hmm. that the TV really mm -hmm. enabled me to do. What impact did it have on you personally, um, the, the so-called fame element of it? I mean, I think it, it's different if you're an actor, if it's different if that's what you chose to do and, and you wanted to be a TV star or a celebrity. You know, I'm neither one of those. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a businessman. It's my first passion, it's what I love to do. And I'm not really a, a TV personality. It's not what I think is my strength nor my forte. Um, and I think all of a sudden, it's quite weird because you have no idea the power of that show until you're on it. And just to give you an extreme example, um, I decided about four or five years ago to go to Mecca to do my pilgrimage and do my Hajj. So you can imagine the mindset you must be in to want to do that. Very spiritual, very pre-planned. And of course, you don't imagine that you're going to be in, in Mecca and be recognized because that's not what you think <laughs> it's about. Anyway, so, and of course, I'd never been before, so I didn't really know how it all worked. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm in Mecca and, and I hadn't appreciated 
that each country is kind of segregated. So Britain has its share in America, et cetera, et cetera. Again, it didn't dawn on me, that's how it works. Anyway, so I'm standing in this particular area and you know, everybody's staring at me. And I'm saying to my wife, I said, have I got anything on my face or <laughs> something wrong? And she said, why? I said, because everywhere I look, I'm just sensing everybody staring at me and I don't quite understand why. And anyway, so as I'm going up to, to get some food, I can see this woman with a mobile phone taking a picture. <laughs> so I went up to her and I said, can I help you? And she said, I can't believe. She said, you know, you're my favorite dragon and my family adore you. And I'm thinking, I'm in Mecca. This is Saudi Arabia. What on earth? So I said to her, where are you from? She said, Leicester. <laughs> so I said, really? So, she, so I said, you know, like, how did you recognize? She said, well, of course, you know, watch the show. And she said, don't you realize? She said, everybody here is from London and Britain. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so, you know, everybody was kind of fascinated that there's this guy from TV here doing, you know, his hudge, which, and that just kind of illustrates. So whether I've been in South Africa or Mecca or anywhere you can imagine, the power of television is just beyond anything I could have imagined. Fast forward to today, and uh, you're currently chairman of um, Startup Loans, okay, with um, Dr. Cable, um, the business secretary. I think in the last count I saw, 13,000 businesses started with loans you've dished out of our money, by the way, taxpayers' money. What possessed you to get into that? Tell us something more about startup loans. I don't know how many of you would have heard of this concept uh, that the government um, launched in 2012, and James is chairman of uh, startup loans. Very impressive. It's been hugely impressive in two to three years. Tell us something about it, please. I would say probably in my career, that has probably been the one thing that I've done which I'm probably the most proud of. How that really happened is I got a, a call from Downing Street about two years ago where the government had come up with an idea that they felt that Britain needs to become more of an entrepreneurial society, that we need to have a culture of enterprise, that you know, looking at how we position ourselves in the world we need to create more talent in terms of innovation and creativity and therefore as a country we need to start more businesses and they approached me and said look you know as an entrepreneur you're quite well known and people identify entrepreneurship with you and what we'd like to do is we'd like to create an organization that encourages people to start their own business and it kind of sounded like a bit of a dragon's den pitch to me so i said it sounds really interesting how many businesses would you like me to start? And they said, we kind of exp had an idea of starting a thousand businesses. At which point I nearly fell off the chair. And I thought, geez, uh, you know, I've started 14 Dragon's Den. How do you start a thousand businesses? Anyway, so I said, it sounds really interesting. Um, just out of curiosity, who's going to fund these businesses? Who puts up the capital? And they said, we've allocated um, initial fund of 84 million pounds. So I thought, okay, well, that's fair. That's reasonable. I can, I can probably do something with that. Uh, and I said, do you, have any, um, do you have an infrastructure? Is there a department? Is there any people? Uh, and they said, no. So I said, what do you have? They said, we have the idea and we have the capital. What we need is for you to go out and find these people, identify talent, and start businesses for the UK economy. I said, but can you imagine, to start a 1,000 businesses, the infrastructure, the people, the resources, the technology, the tracking, the monitoring, providing mentors. I mean, that sounds like a bank to me. And they said, that's why we came to you, because mm -hmm. we think you're an expert in starting businesses. So I said, let me think about it. And I, and I reflected and came back to the office, spoke to some of my directors and said, you know, what do you think? Because it sounds amazing. And they said, James, don't be so ridiculous. You have a day job. You have 40 businesses that you currently can't manage. To start a thousand business, do you have any idea the amount of time that would take? Anyway, we spent a month debating this at Hamilton Bradshaw, and, and pretty much everybody said, don't do it. So you can pretty much imagine what I did. As crazy as it sounded, I said yes, and literally started a company from scratch, launched the name, launched the brand, went around the UK, and I identified 40 organizations who interact with people who have business ideas, as my potential partners to get distribution on the ground. Um, I've now got 160 individual people employed around the country who vet individuals and assess their business plans. I've recruited just over 5,000 mentors who mentor 
each of the businesses that I start. And within the first four months, I started 1,100 businesses um, from a target of 1,000 in three years. By the end of the first year, I'd started 8,000 businesses. I've just finished year two, where I finished on just over 15,000 businesses. And by June, we're up to 17,400. We've literally created tens of thousands of jobs across the UK economy. Um, of course, I ran out of the 84 million. That didn't last as long as I thought it would. I currently have committed funding from the Treasury of 380 million pounds. My target is to start 25,000 businesses by March of next year and have created 100,000 jobs before I step down as chairman. Um, and just to be clear, you don't get paid for this. Sadly not, no. Okay. Just in case any of you walked away thinking he's making loads of money out of it, he's not actually. Uh, unfortunately, not only do I not get paid, but so far it's cost me personally probably just over half a million pounds of my own capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's actually no real financial gain. No, we're, we're very grateful as uh, British taxpayers to you for your efforts in that. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one more question and then we're going to throw up the Q&A. So, um, the, the old um, Indian president, um, Abdul Kalam, said, uh, you have to dream before dreams come true. And entrepreneurs have, this, have these visions in their mind which drive them. They have ambition, they have hunger, they have uh, lots of uh, attri attributes, as you mentioned, and then some they acquire along the way, and some they hire people to fill them in. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you was, what is the X factor in your case? Uh, what do you think is the X factor that puts you apart from most other entrepreneurs and businessmen, businesswomen, and has made you uh, as successful as you are? And, and what advice would you give uh, to those who are budding entrepreneurs out here right now? Um, I mean, I think that one of the lessons that I've learned is people think to be a successful businessman, you have to be ruthless, you have to be aggressive. Um, and actually, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think to be a successful businessman, I think you have to kind of understand the principles of what I call the win-win formula. I think business is not about transactions, it's about relationships. And one of the fundamental principles that I've always believed in, in the business that I run, is you, you've got to try and develop a, a relationship where both sides can win. I don't believe that you can be successful and develop long-term relationships where it's a win-lose situation. Winning is, to me, winning means that somebody else loses. But I think if you're gonna be successful, you need to find a formula where both people walk away from a transaction actually and both are successful and just to give you a small example i the business i sold um, alexander man when i sold that business um, i sold it for 68 million and the person i sold it to sold it for 100 million and the guy who sold it for 100 million sold it to the next guy for 260 million and that was sold literally two months ago. And the guy who bought it for 260 million wrote to me and said, you know, I understand you were the founder of the company and we've just acquired this business. We'd love to meet you. So I went along and had lunch with him. And I said, you know, because I thought clearly he'd paid quite a lot of money. I said, how do you feel about the deal? He said, you know what? He said, we got it for a steal. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, really? He said, oh, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. We were delighted. There were four bids for the business. We were delighted we were effective. And the moral of the story is, to me, you know, everybody along the way, they won. And even the guy who paid four times the amount believed that he got a good deal. Mm -hmm. The guy who sold it for 100 believed he got a good deal. And when I look back, so many people, when it was in the Financial Times that the company had been sold for 260 million, lots of people called me to say, you must be gutted. I said, you're absolutely joking. I said, I'm ecstatic. Because to think that was a business I created from a broom cupboard with me, the Yellow Pages, and a phone that today has become the world's most successful outsourcing business that's valued at that number can only give me pride and pleasure that, that actually people value the business so much. They said, but James, you sold it for 200 million less 
I said, because at the time it was the right decision for me. It was the right number and I, nobody forced me to sell it. I did it through choice. So I think the principle of understanding that in every situation, you've got to be able to put yourself in the other person's position and say, would I do that deal? Would I do that transaction? So I think my key lesson that differentiates, and I think um, even on Dragon's Den, you know, I could have been quite aggressive, but my belief was, you know, I was there to, to not to humiliate people or not to belittle people, but I'm there as an investor. And if I like an investment, I should be polite to the person. But at the same time, if I don't like the investment, there's no need, you know, to kind of belittle or criticize somebody because actually we're there to inspire and motivate people. So those principles of, you know, to me, in 30 years, I would say the fundamental principle of business that I've adopted is the word reasonable and fair. Everything you do, providing it is reasonable and fair, it kind of works. If it's not fair for you, it's not fair for the other person. If it's not reasonable, the truth is it's not going to happen. So I don't, you know, I can give you some very philosophical issue, but actually I think there is a perception that says you have to be ruthless. I'm not, I think there are people who can be very successful, but be fair at the same time. And I think that's quite an important ingredient because we can all have a good month or a good quarter, but I think to be successful over 30 years, you have to have deeper rooted principles that you believe in that you wouldn't compromise on. What were the other significant moral aspects that drive your business, drive your business acumen at the moment? The, the single biggest factor for me um, that I think is one of the biggest factors of success is the belief that businesses are built and run by people not by products and services. I think so many entrepreneurs that I meet are really obsessed with this product. They've got this ingenious idea and it could be a mobile phone or a product. And somehow they think because it's a great idea, it's just gonna take off by itself and become successful. The answer is it doesn't. What succeeds in business is the drive and the passion of the people behind the business. So, to me, I look beyond the product and service and actually invest in the people or the team that you hire. You know, when I look to sell a business, you know, I have a business that's, that's gonna be um, sold this month and I've had probably four offers and this business is valued at just over 150 million pounds. Um, what do you think the key thing that people look for when they're buying that business is the management team. If they did buy into the management team, there is no transaction. So that, to me, kind of consistently reminds you of the importance of attracting and investing in the best talent you can have, because that business I bought five or six years ago for just over eight million, it's done phenomenally well, not because of me or the brand, but the people that I bought on and the people I invested in have, are the ones that have created that success. So I think the key lesson any entrepreneur, any business, whether you're Norton Rose or whether you're an entrepreneur, the principle is the same. You're only as good as the people you have. And if you're not focusing on, so I'll give you a simple idea. Most entrepreneurs, CEOs that I meet, spend 5% of their life looking for talent. So if I talk to any CEO across the UK, and I've met thousands, and I ask them the question, how much of your time do you spend on talent acquisition, the average is between five and 10%. I spend 80% of my time doing that. So every other activity I have somebody else dealing with because in the nicest possible way, I think they're commoditized. But the thing that is the most important thing that I could do in my business is focus on attracting the talent. And I do that even if I don't have a vacancy because by attracting the right people, that's the bit that makes the difference in the business. How do you find the right mentors for you? Does it have to be someone from the same industry that you work in? Uh, I think the mentor should come from the industry because the whole principle of mentoring you is to guide you, to advise you, to show you a better way of doing what you're doing. Somebody who doesn't understand your market, your sector or your customers, I think is great at theory but poor at execution. So I absolutely would focus on somebody from the sector. The one thing I wouldn't do is I wouldn't aim too high. So too many people when they're looking for a mentor, so for example, I would be a terrible mentor 
because actually I'm probably too far down the line and some of the decisions that you're making could be £5,000, £10,000. You want a mentor that understands the value and the importance of those decisions and therefore I would find a mentor that is relevant and relative to the size of the business. I made a big mistake in the early years when I was running Alexander Mann. I took on a kind of a mentor and you know he was running a public company with a billion pound turnover. He was a massive name, very successful. And of course, I, I got so turned on by his CV that I thought, my God, amazing. But when I di discussed issues with him, they didn't mean anything to him because the last time he dealt with a 25,000 pound decision was 100 years ago. And he was very matter of fact, you know, it just, and I just didn't think I learned anything. Whereas if I'd identified somebody who was running a business similar to mine, at least he would have more empathy with the challenges that I was facing. So I think A, find somebody who I think should be from your sector and find somebody who's relevant and relative to the size of business because they will understand your issues better than somebody sitting you know, at a public company level.